Apocalyptic Gospel Podcast, where we explore the gospel that Jesus' earliest disciples heard and what the last several decades of historical studies have clarified about this first century Jewish message. Listeners, welcome back to the Apocalyptic Gospel Podcast. I'm Josh Hawkins, and I'm here, as always, with Bill Schofield and with John Harrigan. Hey, guys, what's going on? Hey, buddy. Hello, hello. Great to be with you guys, as always, and listeners, it's great to have you for our final Q&A here of Season 3. We just want to say, as always, that I say this at the beginning of every Q&A episode, we want to say thank you to all of you for your feedback that you've sent through emails, uh, through Twitter. We're so encouraged to see the reviews you've left for us on the various platforms. And so give us a five-star rating, if you can, if you have not yet, on the platform you listen to us on. Again, that helps out the algorithm uh, and helps spread the podcast uh, and makes it more accessible for others to find. As I've mentioned all the time, and if you haven't found it yet, you haven't seen it yet, we have a website, apocalypticgospel.com. And we have so many resources there. We often get questions about resources, books, articles, and things relating to the subjects we're discussing here on our show. And we've made a big, massive list of resources, books, materials, articles you can dig into. And so look at the resources page on our website for that. Of course, the contact form is also on our website where you can get in touch with us if you have any questions or comments you want to leave for us as well as a donate link. Our podcast is listener supported and we have uh, monthly hosting costs and podcast distribution service costs. So if you want to support the podcast in that way, uh, there's a link to donate on our website. Well, guys, without further ado, let's jump into our final Q&A of season three. All right. I'll I'll start with the first question here. Um, This is a question on revival from Joseph. Um, I'm going to abbreviate the question here. It's a little bit longer. Uh, I used to pray for revival in a dominionistic way. Um, In the apocalyptic framework, is there context for a great end-time revival or awakening like described in Matthew 24, 14? What do you think, guys? Mm. Um, Yeah, I think... Matthew 24, 14 gets uh, quoted in a lot of different ways, in different contexts, definitely. I mean, if you don't know Matthew 24, 14, the gospel of the kingdom will be preached as a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come, right? Right. Yeah. Sorry. So uh, so <laughs> it's it's such a mantra in the missions world that it's kind of right. like... Um, right. <laughs> it, the, the problem is, is that in the Olivet Discourse... It doesn't seem to be a positive statement, exactly. uh, but rather it's almost a negative statement um, in which the nations or the Gentiles are already uh, persecuting. Uh, in verse 9, then they'll deliver you up to tribulation and put you to death, and you'll be hated by all the nations for my name's sake. Then... Uh, then many will fall away, betray one another. There'll be false prophets to, to lead many astray uh, because of lawlessness. Will increase the love of me. Will grow cold, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. So you have this intense kind of global uh, persecution, and that's the context into which verse fourteen and the gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed to all the nations as a testimony, and then the end will come. I find particularly the parallel in Mark where he sandwiches that saying in between the other ones that come before in Matthew. So in Mark 13, he puts it this way, be on your guard for they'll deliver you over to councils. You'll be beaten in synagogues. You'll stand before governors and kings for my sake to bear witness before them. And the gospel must be proclaimed to all the Gentiles, and then they will bring you to trial and deliver you over. Do not be anxious about what you'll say beforehand, etc. Brother will deliver brother over to death, child uh, against his father, against his parents, and you will be hated by all for my name's sake, but the one who endures to the end will be saved." So in Mark, it actually puts that saying in the middle of all the persecution. And so the saying is about being faithful in the midst of persecution. Of course, Jews at the time understand um, what later gets termed as the messianic woes. 
that this age culminates in kind of a climactic persecution. Uh, it's, um, you know, based mainly on Daniel 7, where the saints will be handed over for a time, times, a half time. And you get a kind of a, 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 a grand finale uh, of, of persecution and distress at the end of this age. And Jesus seems to be just giving commentary in the Olivet Discourse. And that's what the Olivet Discourse as a whole is talking about, is, right. is giving context that it's not just going to get better. It's not going to be like a Maccabean type of deal. Uh, uh, and, and the glory of the temple will just grow and, and usher in the coming of the Messiah, but rather, it's going to be a a uh, a messianic woes at the end of the age, and the temple will be laid to waste before the coming day of God. And so, I would interpret the whole thing, Matthew twenty four, as in context to the eschatological Jacob's trouble or great distress, and that that's what Matthew twenty four fourteen is talking about. That you have uh, that you have basically that saying as a you will be you are called to be witnesses at the end of the age in context to a global distress before all the gentiles um so in that context the question is is it talking about revival a you know a grand global revival at the end of the age i i don't really see it as far as in in the all of it discourse itself it could be saying that somewhere else but then you have to say, is that idea native to Second Temple Judaism? Is it a presumption of the narrative of history that Jews held, uh, which that doesn't seem to be the case either? And if it's not, then are Jesus and the apostles adding that idea into the Jewish apocalyptic narrative, which I, it doesn't for me, it doesn't really seem to be there either. Yeah, John, I completely agree. And I think if if when we hear the word revival, there's just a lot of overtones from the charismatic movement, from the Pentecostal movement, from historical movements, and even in the modern day. But we want to do exactly what you said, base our understanding of where this is headed on how a Jew would have understood it from the first century. Really, this is the whole point of our show, right, is, is to explain how they understood it from the first century, what they were expecting, what they were looking forward to, and then say, okay, how do the words of Jesus fit within that context, right? So if we want to expect global persecution and martyrdom at the end of the age as a demonstration to the wicked and demonstration to rebellious Israel of God's covenant faithfulness— and if that's what constitutes revival, then yeah, we're in. <laughs> uh, but but in terms of how it's often structured in in other narratives, mm, probably not. Yeah, and I think the takeaway is that the the push is for a faithful witness. Exactly. And how, whatever God does in relation to that, that's not in our hands. Uh, our responsibility right. is faithfulness and boldness in our witness. And yeah. let God work out yeah. the rest, however it's going to unfold, rather than a push to take over the earth, exactly, and the twelve and the seven mountains or whatever, and all that stuff. It's like uh, it, that seems to be derailed. Yeah, it, it seems much more Maccabean revolt style, which Jesus had a lot of words against. Right, God's hand alone brings the redemption. We've discussed this often in the past, so yeah, great thoughts, guys. Yeah. So our next question comes from Alex, and Alex says, I've learned about medieval exegesis recently where the four methods of interpreting scripture came about, historical, allegorical, tropological, and anagogical. What do you think about these different methods and their use in studying the scriptures today as it relates to a Jewish cruciform apocalyptic worldview? Um, yeah, I'll, uh, it, I think... Alex seems to be referencing John Cassian's kind of uh, fourfold description of hermeneutics in the fifth century that kind of became uh, a template uh, for hermeneutics throughout the you know Middle Ages. And as I understand, which I'm I'm definitely no expert in in medieval exegesis, um, anything you know after uh, the early Nicene's. Anything after the Antonicene uh, fathers, I'm I get pretty fuzzy on, and uh, I'm not super uh, versed with John Cassian. But as I understand it, 
enough qualifications, sorry. Mm-hmm. As I understand it, uh, he was trying to uh, kind of synthesize the division between the Antiochian and the Alexandrian schools. And the Antiochian school was pushing for kind of a, a literal historical uh, sense of the scriptures as primary, and the Alexandrian school was pushing for a spiritual allegorical uh, sense. And so he seemed to be kind of synthesizing those two worlds, but more siding with the Antiochian side and, and pushing for the literal historical sense as the primary one, which is in contrast to Origen's threefold sense of Scripture, which which he saw Scripture as literal or material and versus moral and spiritual. Uh, so he kind of divided based on the human person. And the deepest or the most meaningful one is the is the is the spiritual uh, and the others are kind of secondary shocker shocker, shocker. Right now. <laughs> right. um, uh, so so I think the uh, my response to that would be that uh, that the other you know three options weren't really options to first century Jews they they just yeah, uh, it was only the literal, literal historical, according to how Jews at the time interpreted the covenant playing yes. out eschatologically. And so the other ones weren't really on their radar, so to speak. And if they did come on their radar, as in kind of, you know, the protonostic movements uh, that were happening in the late first century, then they're fairly, you know, harshly condemned by by Paul. So. That would be my yeah. take on that. Yeah, and I think a lot of those mechanisms are they're they're evidently late because they're they're based so the 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 whole function is that these tools have is to legitimize novel ideas in the text. And so there's there's a lot of traditions where 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 the text of the of the sacred scriptures is is almost the thing that's canonized, not the message of the scriptures. And so the text can have ideas that were were novel to the first century or novel to what Jesus handed down to the apostles. And those can somehow be legitimized by these tools. And like John said, it's just, it's just, there's a, it's, it's real clear that just a straightforward, the, the, cause the guiding principle of what the text meant was history number one and 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 number two it was there was a meta narrative and that's what was handed down it was handed down orally it was handed down in tradition is there was a meta narrative and all of the text was about the meta narrative it was about the the story of history moving in a particular direction and god's covenant with a certain people yep. and so it, it, these are just kind of like little mechanisms that people have made to like sever the text from the narrative of history so that they can come up with novel ideas. And it's not to say that, you know, all of it's demonic and shouldn't whatever, but it's just to say the reason that nobody's talking about like Paul and Peter aren't discussing these things is because they, they actually value what, what the text was saying and they don't need special tools to figure out something new. Right. Right. And there's no like secret special knowledge and the, the, the text, you can't just draw out of it, whatever. A great example of this that comes to mind is Paula Fredrickson wrote, uh, and it was sometime like 2009 or 10. She wrote a, a chapter in a book, uh, called St. Paul among the philosophers. And it just had a bunch of people like, I, I don't know if they're all, uh, secular, but it was like, philosophical guys, not like religious studies guys. And they all, you know, there's like a psychologist in there and whatever. And and they all kind of waxed on about Paul. And then Paula came in and was just like, you see, as a historian, we don't get to do what you guys do. We we don't we don't get to just read into right. Paul whatever we want Paul to say. Paul actually lived in a historical context that we have to understand and we derive our understanding of 
what he's saying, what words he's saying based on the historical context of what those words meant to Jews at the time. (laughs) And she basically just, you know, shreds them to pieces. It's awesome. (laughs) And so, but it's a little bit like that where it's just like that there's not an option for these other interpretive uh, methods. They're totally novel to to the text uh, as first century Jews understood it. Yeah, really good. Okay, so the next question is from David, and David has a very specific question about why Paul cites uh, Psalm 68 in Ephesians 4 the way he does. And uh, it's kind of a long question, but he basically says it sounds like some kind of realized eschatology that Paul is talking about at the Ascension. How does it fit with Paul's uh, native Jewish apocalyptic worldview? Well, I'll take a stab at this one just generally, I think, real quick, that I think as we've been talking about all season, a good base assumption when you see a quote of the Tanakh in the New Testament is to assume that there is no redefinition or reimagination of the Jewish apocalyptic framework as developed out of the Tanakh and in Second Temple literature. That's presupposed, right? That this is what how Jews were thinking in the first century. And so when you come to a quote of the Tanakh, rather than thinking, oh, something's been reimagined or redefined and, you know, because re- really this is what, as we've talked about even in our episode back in season one on Psalm 110 in Acts chapter two, the way that that's often interpreted as sit at my right hand and Peter's quoting it to say, look, Jesus is now reigning on his throne in heaven and his kingdom is inaugurated and established and all of these things are happening in terms of realized eschatology. Yeah. But if you look at it through the lens of how a Jew would have viewed it in the first century, assuming the apocalyptic narrative has developed out of the Tanakh and through Second Temple literature, you go, okay, if that's the framework, this is probably the the base assumption that's going on in any passage you read in the Tanakh uh, rather in the New Testament that's quoting the Tanakh. So that's a good place to start. Now, that's not to say that there aren't other things that have to be taken into account, but that I think is a, a helpful starting point when approaching a passage like this. Yeah, and and generally speaking, I mean, there's so many references in Ephesians to things like uh, the return of Jesus, the day of the Lord, the day of redemption, uh, the eternal life, the resurrection, our eternal inheritance, uh, the kingdom of God, you know, in chapter five, that uh, everyone who's sexually immoral, impure, covetous, etc., has no inheritance in the kingdom of God. And so these references don't have any explanation attached to them. They're common Jewish eschatological uh, themes and ideas. And the presupposition is that Paul is in Ephesians, in Colossians particularly, Paul is theologizing about the inclusion of the Gentiles within that native Jewish apocalyptic worldview, like you're talking about, Josh, that that's just kind of presupposed as the framework for this novel reality that God is doing. And so similarly, the death and ascension of the Messiah is interpreted within that, you know, presupposed framework. So particularly like in chapter two, which people get hung up on, where you get the reference to, you know, uh, that Christ raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable richness, riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. Well, yes, Within that Jewish apocalyptic narrative, the Messiah died, was raised up, and is sitting at the right hand of God. But the, what is he doing at the right hand of God? Well, he's waiting patiently to make his enemies his footstool. He's, he's functioning within that Jewish right. apocalyptic meta narrative, like Bill's talking about, and that we are with him in spirit in that context because he saved us by grace. Through faith, he saved us from the wrath of God that's coming, the coming wrath, by our faith in his grace and mercy in the Messiah dying on our, on our behalf. And so that's the context of chapter two. There's nothing in chapter two where Paul is talking about, 
he's spiritually realized the future kingdom and resurrection. That's not even referenced at all. Uh, so, so the point is, is that if it's not referenced at all, then the the meta, the meta narrative is is being presupposed. So then, when you come to chapter four, it seems like this is the same thing happening with Psalm sixty eight, where um, and I don't know Psalm sixty eight real well, but it it seems like that's what Psalm sixty eight is a historical reflection on Mount Sinai and the Lord coming with his angels and the glory of Sinai. And and that event at Sinai was projected by Second Temple Jews eschatologically, uh, as seen in like First Enoch 1, that that, that is where he came uh, in glory and he kind of inaugurated the whole thing with the nation at Sinai. And that's where he's going to conclude it eschatologically. So it seems like, you know, the, the point of what Paul is saying is that the, the ascension is like Sinai, which will be like the coming of Christ Jesus. And uh, and so the ascension is an, uh, another example of God demonstrating his power in light of the eschatological conclusion. That doesn't mean that Paul understood the ascension as a realization of the conclusion. It's like if if, you know, if we get healed, if if my arm is broken and it gets healed, I don't think of that healing as a realization of the future resurrection of my body. I, it did, right. It's just my arm got healed. Right. That's all. It, and it was a miracle. And praise God. Yeah. That means the res. I mean, yeah. if God's active now, that means the resurrection. He's going to be active in the future. And so it's it, there's no reason to like project onto my healed arm a spiritual realization of the future glory of my resurrected body. I mean, I guess I could, right. but it it just doesn't seem like <laughs> necessary. You know what I mean? So, yeah. so you seems, most definitely could. Right. It may have been done a <laughs> time or two before. So anyway, so Ephesians four, it kind of seems that way, where it, it, that's how Psalm sixty eight is being interpreted, but not as a reconstruction or or redefinition of his Jewish apocalyptic hopes. Exactly. That's good, John. All right, let's look at our next question. This one comes from Matthew. And Matthew says, what are your thoughts on the Trinity from a first century Jewish viewpoint? I believe Jesus is God's son and not God, and I therefore do not believe in the Trinity. I like how you guys dig into the Bible and come to an understanding that may not be popular in Christianity today, flipping traditions on their head. Do you think this is a doctrine that could one day change? Um, <clears throat> no, no, uh, <laughs> uh, we, uh, n- none of us, uh, would adhere to that. I, I think we're all very firmly on the same page that, uh, Jesus of Nazareth was the God of Israel in flesh. Yes. And, uh, and that yeah. this is not, uh, something that would be foreign to second temple Judaism. Uh, I think this was, uh, has become, Fairly widely known in the academy, particularly with Alan Seg- uh, Segal's uh, book, uh, whatever, Two Powers in Heaven. Yeah, Two uh, Powers in Heaven. That uh, Daniel Boyarin at University of Berkeley, he's really kind of taken up that mantle that the divinity of the Messiah was not something outside the box for Second Temple Jews. Uh, it was basically just a, a, re- a reflection and extrapolation on passages like Daniel 7. For example, like in 4th Ezra 7, you get this back and forth between God and the Messiah and who is the Ancient of Days and who's executing the judgment and that it, it melds together. And, uh, and it wasn't until the second century that borderlines between the early Gentile Christian uh, apologists and the early rabbis were kind of drawn that you get this right. uh, real right. negative attitude towards the divinity of the Messiah. But in Second Temple Judaism, uh, there's not that attitude. It's just not there. And uh, divine Messiah was not uh, something uh, that was uh, strange or impossible. I mean, the later conversation about the Trinity and how that all developed, like, that's a later conversation, right? But in terms of how Second Temple Jews understood this, I mean, this is like what you're saying, how Daniel Boyarin makes this super, super clear. Definitely check out his book, Borderlines. As you said, UC scholar, uh, UC Berkeley scholar. 
Yeah, it really, in Second Temple uh, Jewish tradition, you have everything from the the Mimra tradition, which which is derived from the Targums. The there's a <clears throat> there seems to be some like a substantial Melchizedek tradition out of Qumran that developed that that also presents the Messiah as as being related to God or being God in some way. And the later on Metatron tradition um, from the Talmud um, does the same. And, and so they're, they're, that's not really an issue of controversy in the first century. I think that's, the, I think that's probably the best way to approach it. Um, there, I, remember, I remember hearing, you know, even in the Talmud, while they're kind of trying to separate themselves from the idea one of the stories actually has some of the rabbis, including Rabbi Akiva, who's one of the most well-respected rabbis in the Talmud. And Rabbi Akiva is, they're, they're commenting on Daniel 7, and Rabbi Akiva says, um, what does it mean when, or one of the rabbis asks, what does it mean when it says, and thrones were set up for judgment? Thrones. Why does it say thrones and not throne? Who are the other people sitting on thrones? Only God sits on a throne in heaven. And Rabbi Akiva goes, I think it's David sitting on a throne in heaven. And the other rabbis rebuke him and they go, "Um, hello, that would make him God. And so he goes, okay, okay. But he has these reasons. And so like even in the Talmud, they're kind of teasing out the conversation coming to an end in, you know, rabbinic orthodoxy. But even Rabbi Akiva presents like a tradition of like, there seems like there's more going on there. Even if the conclusion is that he's wrong, it's still, there, there's still that discussion. The Mimra is, is essentially the conversation of like, in the words of First John, um, the word, the, in the beginning was the word and the word was God and the word was with God and all that. <clears throat> so John that's, one, yeah. that's likely derived from, the memory tradition in the Targums, because there's starting in Genesis 15, going on to like uh, in Ezekiel 1 and, and passages like that, the word of the Lord, when the word of the Lord comes to someone, frequently in the Tanakh, the word of the Lord is a separate person right. than just the Lord, but the person is also called the Lord. Right. <laughs> and so he's called Yahweh, but he's not Yahweh. And so a tradition develops in the Targums that God would send an agent that was known as his memra, which is Aramaic for word. He was his word. But when people would talk to him, like in Genesis 18, the word of the Lord came to Abram, but Abraham, Abram would frequently call him Yahweh when talking to him. And, and so the same thing is in Genesis 15. And so that, the Melchizedek tradition of the Messiah coming from heaven, being associated with God in some way, and the Metatron tradition is similar to Melchizedek. So th- none of these things were out of bounds until later on. Right. So they weren't like, <clears throat> like Josh said, there's a later conversation about the Trinity, but <clears throat> even beyond, because that was really... Um, a lot of that was the time of Tertullian, but even later on with Augustine, when you have the controversy with the Arians, that's really where everybody starts to look back as though Jesus and Paul's main issue of, of, of controversy was over the divinity of the Messiah. But that's not really what they were talking about most of the time. Right. In fact, I, I, I think that you can understand almost every blasphemy accusation as being primarily about authority and function, not about ontology. They're not upset that Jesus is claiming to be divine. They're upset that he's claiming that the authority of his words surpasses the authority of kind of the continuing tradition that some of them are building. And so they're, they're not happy about that. But I, and that's why they claim blasphemy, and that's why they claim he makes himself equal to God. It's not about his ontology or the substance he's made of. It's about authority and and who's and and whose authority is is being vindicated in this situation. So, I I think I, I agree with I agree with John and what Josh was saying. 
it's it might be characterized in in somewhat of a pagan way with with the trinity but Jews in the second temple period really didn't have they weren't really shy about considering even before the time of Jesus that the desi- that the messiah could be divine in some way yeah and just to follow up on the charge of blasphemy if anybody wants to like dig into that there's really one book that is exhaustive and everybody on earth in the in the academic world knows <laughs> the one book which Daryl Bach did uh, uh, called Blasphemy and Exaltation in Judaism and uh, the on the and he does it on the charge of Jesus and in, in Matthew 14 and so it's I don't remember it's like a thousand pages it's just ridiculous and it it basically tracks every possible angle and and the historical context and then later, you know, in Talmudic tradition. And it is completely exhaustive. But the but the point that Bach really argues and, you know, Bach loves to change Jewish apocalyptic thought. So he's not he's not he biased in that way. I, and we're not promoting Daryl Bach, whatever. It, it's just that on that particular aspect of the charge of blasphemy, it's it's not primarily an ontological reality that's going on. It's primarily a functional reality that the charge of blasphemy is is related to and and disrespecting the elders of the court of the Sanhedrin is uh, one of the main charges for blasphemy within uh, Second Temple Judaism and in Talmudic material. And so that's more the drive uh, that's happening in the condemnation of uh, uh, the accusation of blasphemy against Jesus, uh, rather than somehow Jews just couldn't believe that uh, the Messiah could be God and therefore they killed him because of that. That's not why the the uh, execution happened. Right, right. And while we're on the subject of resources, uh, based on what you were talking about earlier, Bill, about the Memra tradition, uh, a good resource on that is by a guy who's building upon the work of Martin McNamara and the Targums. This is John Ronning. And his book, The Jewish Targums and John's Logos Theology, is where he develops uh, this memory tradition in terms of how it's understood in John 1 in huge detail. And I think it's super, super helpful as well. So uh, we'll put a link to that in the show notes as well. All right. Guys, let's move on to our last question. And this is a really good one. This one comes from Zach. And Zach asks, how do we know the account of God's faithfulness within the Tanakh is actually reliable? Because he says, the main criticism of the Tanakh's historicity seems to be propaganda. There are those both postmodern believers and secular scholars who claim that the Old Testament writings are simply Jewish propaganda depicting hyperbolic, dramatic works of God and temperamental favor in times of war, etc., just as other ancient civilizations did in their, quote-unquote, historical writings. Now, if Mm -hmm. interpreting scripture within the context of other historical accounts of that era, as we do with Second Temple literature for the New Testament, if that gives clarity on historical context and prose, literary devices, etc., etc., then why would we not interpret the Jewish scriptures in the same light as other civilizations, quote-unquote, history? We say theirs are legends, fables, or propaganda, but ours is historical. How is that not an inconsistent hermeneutic? So... Before we dive into an answer, I, I think I'll just say that, I mean, we we know Zach, and Zach is not a proponent of the Tanakh as propaganda, um, and Zach is coming from the place of really asking how to best defend the historicity of the Tanakh and its interpretation, right? So how do we know, guys? Like, let's get into this a little bit. How do we know the account of God's faithfulness within the Tanakh is actually reliable, and how do we know it's not just historical propaganda from some ancient Near Eastern culture? Yeah, good, uh, good question, Zach. <clears throat> and and just to uh, just to say it at the onset, uh, this this may not be relevant to you at all, listener. Um, to some of you, it won't be. Um, but some are probably wondering about these questions. Um, I, I we know that just kind of like we don't know a lot of you personally, but but and so we're kind of in some way, just kind of talking heads. But 
but and there are there are thought leaders all over the internet with with deconstruction ideas that that might seem just as credible as this idea or that idea and so i i think uh I think it's probably good just to address these things. And uh, so if you find it helpful, um, then praise the Lord. And if not, then then I uh, hope we can answer Zach's question adequately. Hopefully we can be more than just another few YouTube theologians that say some random things. Hopefully we can come at you with some real documentation and history and thoughts that are provoking more than just like, oh, well, I don't think this is true and I'm done with my faith. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. <laughs> right, and and that's that's yes, yeah, so that's a little different story. Uh, I so I, I, just to say, just to try to answer the the first part, which is really about the Tanakh historicity um, and propaganda, and the claim that that uh, the texts are you know the that the that the Tanakh is really just uh, Jewish propaganda texts. Um, so. First, like this is not this is not consistent with what we know from the ancient Near East as propaganda text. So, the propaganda text: the good guy was never the deity. The deity was kind of mobilized, and and all these ancient cuneiform writings were were mobilized to give validity to a king or a monarchy or a dynasty. It wasn't the god who's the good guy; it's the king or the people, and um. Like, like you have in like some Egyptian accounts of, uh, of, I forget the text, Joshua Berman, who was on our show last season, he has a, a couple chapters in his book on inconsistencies in the Torah about how, um, about, uh, how, how there's a, there's a well known, there's a well known battle between Egypt and another civilization, and both of them wrote about the battle, and they both wrote about how they had both won, and like they had just obliterated the enemy, and they were both so dominant in the battle. And but that's the nature of propaganda texts: is you, your country, and your king are incredible, and they're amazing, and they always do amazing things. And that's nothing like the Tanakh. Like Israel right. is not ever amazing, hardly. If if they're amazing, it's only for a minute, and it's kind of only by accident. And so it really doesn't have any any sort of. It's not. They're not of the same nature, and it, it, and so it's a mischaracterization to say they're like the other ones. You know. Um, so they don't fit into national propaganda texts because Israel are not the good guys. Um, and as far as like other, other kind of mythic traditions like the epics of Gilgamesh and the flood story or Atrahasis and the flood story, they're, they're also very different. Um, like the gods are, the gods of all the pagan mythologies are the same. And the God of Israel is very unique. The gods, the gods of the nations are basically very human in their temperament. And the God of Israel is long suffering and humble and he's just odd. And so he is the, the testimony about the God of Israel is consistent throughout the Tanakh. He's completely uni- unique to the other gods, completely unique. Uh, Atrahasis and Gilgamesh, the flood stories, present the gods at the flood. Yeah, there's a global flood. It's the same. Well, no, it's not the same. The, the, yes, the gods sent it, but the gods sent it because they were annoyed that the people were making too much noise and they couldn't sleep. And so they said, let's send a flood and kill all the humans so they stop making all the noise. And then they only stopped the flood because the humans stopped giving them sacrifices and they were starving. And so I said, let's not kill all the humans. Let's save a few of them on a boat like the Atraha, or the, the Gilgamesh boat is, is this strange cube that I, I don't even know how that would have floated. It kind of would have just kind of tumbled, <laughs> but, right. but, um, so the, the nature of them are, they're, they're just very different. They're just very different. Uh, so the way the gods are spoken of is not about the virtues of the gods. It's actually about the. It's actually about the gods are simply kind of characters to, to validate and give honor 
to the dynasty or to the, the the king who's in power at the time. And and as far as like nationalistic propaganda texts, the 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 people are always amazing and never do anything wrong in propaganda texts. And that is just the opposite of the nature of the Tanakh stories. And and, and lastly, like another another really common claim is uh, that Zoroastrian thought led to uh, apocalyptic thought in Judaism, and that is um, almost certainly not the case. It's, it is very common. Um, it's not without. It's not with consensus at this point because it used to be thought that that Judaism went into, and it still is by a lot of the academy. Judaism that that the Jewish people went into Persia and they left with monotheism and they left with apocalypticism and convictions about the resurrection of the dead and things like that. But that, that, there's just, there's no evidence for that. And, and, and the nature of how Zoroastrians thought about the afterlife and things, it's, it's very different. It's, um, most likely scenario in my opinion is that it was the, is the other way around. There, number one, there is no consensus on when Zoroaster lived, the founder of Zoroastrianism, but but at the very earliest, he lived three hundred like three hundred years after Abraham. That's the very earliest. So the likelihood of which one influenced who is, in my opinion, the other way around. But um, and I'm not alone. I've 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 read it in 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 by some academic writers before. But so without going into detail on that, I I think that. The, the evidence for Zoroastrianism influencing Judaism is weaker and weaker as the years go, go on. Yeah. No, that's good, Bill. So Sorry, that was a to lot. To sum it up, <laughs> no, it, it, it's good. I, I think these details are really important. Just to sum up what you said here, ancient Near Eastern propaganda texts, they're not like the Tanakh because the Tanakh presents Israel as not so awesome. Ancient Near Eastern propaganda texts are present the nation or the king as typically amazing and awesome. Um, in the Tanakh, most of the kings are really, really bad. Um, and in the Tanakh, God is the hero. Well, in in ancient years and propaganda texts, it really is the opposite way around. It's the king or the nation is awesome. The gods are kind of there to like bolster the king and the nation. So that's a huge difference, right? Okay, the other thing you said was about the flood text. Um, the way that the gods are spoken about in ancient Near Eastern propaganda texts is very different than in the Tanakh. They're just characters that are there to validate or give honor to the king or to the dynasty in power. And humans really don't do anything wrong in those propaganda texts. But in the Tanakh, hmm, there is lots of issues uh, with humans. And <laughs> so, so just in character... As you're saying, Bill, just in character from the the differences between the Tanakh and ancient Near Eastern propaganda texts, there's a massive difference. Yeah, and if anybody wants to like really dig into it, you need to get James Pritchard's uh, ANET, uh, Ancient Near Eastern Texts that relate to the Old Testament. It's yeah. kind of the standard uh, work, like Charles Worth on the Pseudepigrapha. Uh, and so the ANET really... Yeah. It it just uh, compiles all of the ancient Near Eastern texts, mythology, legends, writings uh, that have any kind of um, overlap or or relation to the Old Testament. And when you actually read those texts, it becomes obvious that that they're different universes. And so right. a great article that comes to mind is uh, Noel Weeks wrote an article in the Westminster Theological Journal, I don't remember, maybe 20 years ago, called Cosmology in Historical Context. And that's a great article that just kind of demonstrates uh, his pushback against the whole idea that, um, you know, the the Jews just believed the structure of the universe, like all the other ancient Near Eastern peoples, you know, a flat earth with a big metal dome and the stars and, and sun kind of float across it like lily pads. And it's a three story universe and da, 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 da. And, you know, Noel Weeks does a great job of coming in and just saying, 
there's no universal ancient cosmology. It, it's not mm-hmm. there. That, mm-hmm. That's something that is created by historical critical scholars of the Old Testament to kind of say, well, you know, the, the, the Old Testament's not inspired. It's not real. Therefore, the New Testament isn't either. And it's just kind of a deconstruct the Bible game. And it's based on this idea that, that, you know, the, the Old Testament is basically just the same beliefs as what people around them held. And when you actually read what people around the Jews, what they actually believed, it's bizarre. It's their, their worldview, you know, it's like, whatever, the universe was an egg and it split open and two gods came out (laughs) and they went to war against each other. And it's not even remotely the same. And then the gods, like Bill was saying, are they're not like, you know, the gods aren't necessarily good. They're not good at all. They're, they're, it's not like, you know, we kind of have this um, the, this uh, conditioning that God is good and the gods are good. And that's just not how the ancient world viewed the gods. It, it's right. it's a little right. bit like, you know, le- that whatever, the new Thor movie, Love and Thunder. And, you know, the guy <laughs> comes up and, and is worshiping and it turns out, well, the gods aren't good at all. Uh, and so the ancient world, the gods weren't necessarily good. Uh, the gods right. were were self serving, just like all the humans were self serving, and it was yes. just one big system. It's more like the gods in Hinduism. If you've ever been to India and and related in that world, uh, it's uh, it's kind of a, a caste system, and and everybody's has their own domain. And so the projection of our ideas back on the historical reality, uh, really usually it's, it's overgeneralized a lot of times and it it doesn't actually line up with history. Yeah. Really what you have is you have these pagan contexts speaking of what they know, which is broken humans. And all of Mm -hmm. the attributes of the gods are broken human attributes. And, and you have just more powerful. Yeah. They're just stronger. <laughs> yeah. But, but you, yeah. then you have like the accounts, the accounts of like Exodus 33 and, and Abraham and, uh, and Moses saying to God, like, you're weird. I don't understand you at all. <laughs> if you don't right. show me your ways, I don't even know if I can keep going. Why are you so weird? Right. And, and that's when he, you know, he does the, he's, you know, the Exodus 34 bit. Where he says, I am Yahweh, Yahweh the God who's uh, compassionate and gracious and slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and loyalty and et cetera, et cetera. But the point, the whole point of that narrative is, is that nobody had ever heard of a divinity like that. And that's why right. Moses is so freaked out. And he's like, I don't even understand you. What are, what's the, what are you like anyways? And that's, and that's the contrast is ancient Near Eastern gods, and they're just like people. I wonder why. Because that's all they know. They're just writing about what they know. Yeah. And like the gods in the ancient world, I mean, there's so much there. What motivates them to do really weird things is, man, like, well, we should stop the flood because we're hungry. Or humans aren't giving us food. Or it, it's war and greed and envy and all of the things that are, you know, characterizing wicked humanity then come to characterize the gods. And the God of Israel is nothing like that. And as you're saying, Exodus 34, this is why Moses is freaking out. But I think that can help explain and give a really important foundational reason as to why the Tanakh is not like those propaganda texts. Because the God of Israel, as we read about in the Tanakh, has actually foretold things that have transpired in real verifiable history. That these events that have come to pass are around, based around his covenant with Israel, not all of the uh, strange things that the gods of these ancient Near Eastern cultures do and that we read about in those propaganda texts. Like the character of the God of Israel to actually do what he said, not to just be like, cool, I'm here to kind of promote, you know, some king and dynasty and all this and, and to, you know, act like fallen, broken humans. I mean, the account of the Tanakh and the God of the Tanakh and the God of 
the Jews is completely and utterly different. And he actually says things and brings them to pass, right? So we have verifiable historical evidence and records that can make us go, okay, the God of Israel made promises and he actually brought them to pass. Do any of the gods of the ancient Near Eastern world make promises and have them come to pass in verifiable history hundreds of years after the fact? Hmm. Uh, probably not. <laughs> so I think this is, uh, this is another really, really big reason that we can look at and say, well, this is why the Tanakh is more than just another ancient prop- uh, propaganda text from the ancient Near East. And uh, as far as Zach's second question, um, now, just to rephrase it, now, if interpreting Scripture within the context of other historical accounts of that era, as we do a Second Temple literature from New Testament writing, gives clarity on historical context, prose, liter- literary devices, etc., then why would we not interpret the Jewish Scriptures in light of the same, in light of other civilizations' history? We say that their legends, they are legends and fables or propaganda, but ours are historical. How is that not inconsistent? Um, so, so it's a, um, again, like Josh said, we know you're kind of asking from like a third party perspective, like as if the question were being asked to you, but so this is, this is like not a related question at all because it's what we know is that Jewish conversations were happening and we know that from Jewish texts. And so we're taking Jewish concepts from Jewish language and then applying the same principles used in the same language to other Jewish texts. So that's way different than saying it's possible that at some point a Jewish thinker came in contact with a Babylonian and they were comparing notes and he went, oh, that's cool. I'm going to write down some of those things too. Like this is all speculative. It's nothing like using Second Temple Jewish literature that everybody acknowledges came from the same sources, from the same community. And and trying to then, you know, t- trying to do history that way. So that's that that one's quite the leap while Second Temple Judaism is is something that everybody acknowledges is the is the seedbed for the the uh for the thoughts presented in the in the New Testament. Right. It would be like when we're talking about the historical context of Second Temple Judaism, we're we're not talking about uh you know Persian or Greco-Roman texts. We're talking about Jewish apocalyptic texts. We're not even talking about other right. texts within the diaspora. You know, we we rarely we rarely talk about Philo or or Josephus because they're not apocalyptic. They're not talking about the same concepts that are referenced in the New Testament. Um, and so th- that's when we say historical, we're talking about historical context that gives meaning uh, to the New Testament, because they're, like Bill said, they're talking about the same things. Uh, If you're talking about Old Testament criticism, then you're talking about apples and oranges. They're they're not talking about the same things. Exactly. Exactly. Right. Great thoughts, guys. Well, listeners, as we conclude this final Q&A of season three, we have already heard from some of you saying, well, what are you going to do? Are you going to continue? And the answer is yes. We're going to take a little break and return in early 2023 with some new episodes again. We want to move back into the New Testament uh, and develop some ideas that we've been looking at here from the Tanakh in the New Testament. We're not going to necessarily go book by book. I mean, that's a lot of work, but we do want to develop themes and ideas that are either misunderstood or Lots of ideas on the table for season four. But we want to continue to hear from you, so continue to send us your questions, your feedback, any of the episodes here in the first three seasons of our show. And we've mentioned this a little bit in the past on our Twitter account, but uh, we host a fairly regular Zoom meeting where we want to meet up with our listeners and just for the sake of prayer and encouragement and discipleship. So if that's something you're interested in, you'd want to be part of our our uh, Zoom meetings, we'll send you an email when we're planning on hosting another one, but just get in contact with us through the contact form on our website and send us a message there saying you'd be interested in joining us for our Zoom meetings. 
Until 2023, keep an eye on our individual YouTube channels. We're going to link those in our show notes. Uh, If you're looking for more content before our next season begins in 2023, there's a bunch of content we already have on our YouTube channels, and we're going to continue to post some uh, in the months leading up to our new season. Well, John and Bill, we did it. Here we are, the end of season three. Wow. Pretty amazing. Alhamdulillah. Wow. Praise the Lord. We made it this far. Listeners, we hope our season has been encouraging and provoking, and uh, we pray that what we've labored in these uh, past number of months through 30-something episodes of the Tanakh uh, has been provoking to keep you on the path that leads to life. So until our next season, God bless and Maranatha. 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 Thanks for listening to the Apocalyptic Gospel Podcast. For more, visit us on our website at apocalypticgospel.com and follow us on Twitter at Apocalyptic Gospel. 